It is remarkable that Thucydides's name echoes down through the ages as one of the most important literary figures of the ancient Greek world. Uh, when we consider the immense creativity of his contemporaries, right, people who wrote monumental works in philosophy, in science, in uh, dramas, presenting grand ideas and larger-than-life heroes, that, you know, Thucydides did not make it his task to write of topics that were larger than life, but rather of life itself, of events that actually happened, figures that really lived and breathed. Thucydides is considered the first true historian of ancient Greece who witnessed an era that was extraordinary, and he says that everyone around during the time knew that it was extraordinary. It was the period of the Peloponnesian War, when the rivalry between the polis of Athens and Sparta came to a breaking point and erupted into all-out war. It's really a series of conflicts lasting decades, and Thucydides says that this was the greatest event that had happened thus far in the history of the Hellenic people. In this war, the very destiny of the Hellenes hung in the balance and its outcome set the stage basically for the end of that civilization as it had existed and um, led to the eventual subordination of Greece under the Macedonian Empire. And after that, the glory days of Greek antiquity you know, would never really come about again. Now, Thucydides tells us that even though he's an Athenian, he doesn't write this work merely for the Athenians or even for the people that might be his contemporaries. The historical spirit is given a wonderful articulation by Thucydides insofar as he de declares at the very beginning of the work that he writes not for his own age, but for all posterity. And that means that we are actually Thucydides' intended audience. While there might be you know, a few too many names of peoples and places and alliances to keep track of in his work, you know, for a modern reader who's, uh, you know, unfamiliar with, like, the Greek world. But Thucydides even gives us in his initial chapters a background of Greek history, who these people are, who the factions are, such that even somebody with no knowledge in ancient history, if they pay attention, should be able to follow the course of events in the text with um, not too much difficulty. And so Thucydides is therefore untimely. He's not concerned with the narrow focus of his contemporaries or with trends in modern thinking. He's not writing to appease any political faction or agenda. And it's because of his ability to remove himself from the moral perspectives of his time and remove himself from his place of upbringing and regard the conflict with this kind of moral detachment that Thucydides is able to achieve greatness as a historian and why he's regarded as a reliable account of this conflict. Thucydides writes, quote, the absence of romance in my history will, I fear, detract somewhat from its interest. But if it be judged by those inquirers who desire an exact knowledge of the past as an aid to the interpretation of the future, which in the course of human things must resemble if it does not reflect it, I shall be content. In fine, I have written my work not as an essay, which is to win the applause of the moment, but as a possession for all time, end quote. These are all aspects of Thucydides where we recognize immediately why Friedrich Nietzsche counted Thucydides among the most important authors of antiquity and one of the main influences on his thought. Thucydides, unlike many of the Greeks which we have talked about on the podcast, is not a philosopher at least not properly speaking, right? He's not a philosopher in the narrow sense. There are, of course, some ideas that he generates, some philosophical ideas he may generate in the course of interpreting history. But so why a historian? You know, why would Thucydides then be so influential on Nietzsche, a philosopher? During the last productive year of his life in the book Twilight of Idols, uh, there's a section entitled What I Owe the Ancients, and Nietzsche writes the following about Thucydides. Quote, my recreation, my preference, my cure from all Platonism has always been Thucydides. Thucydides and perhaps Machiavelli's Il Principe are most closely related to me by the unconditional will not to delude oneself, but to see reason in reality, not in reason, still less in morality. For that wretched distortion of the Greeks into a cultural idea, which the 
classically educated youth carries into life as a reward for all his classroom lessons, there is no more complete cure than Thucydides. One must follow him line by line and read no less clearly between the lines. There are few thinkers who say so much between the lines. With him, sophist culture, by which I mean realist culture, attains its fullest expression. This invaluable movement in the midst of the morality and ideal swindle of the Socratic schools, which was then breaking out everywhere. Greek philosophy, the decadence of the Hellenic instinct. Thucydides, the great sum, the last revelation of that strong, severe, hard factuality which was instinctive with the older Greeks. In the end, it is courage in the face of reality that distinguishes a man like Thucydides from a man like Plato. Plato is a coward before reality. Consequently, he flees into the ideal. Thucydides has control of himself. Consequently, he also maintains control of things. End quote. So we just talked about Plato and Plato's influence on Nietzsche's work. Um, but it's worth beginning here by reiterating the stance of uh, Thomas Brobier that Plato is such a ubiquitous figure in classical philology that Plat Platonism is sort of just in the oxygen, and that in the course of his work, Nietzsche has to address Plato and his ideas, as all students of classical antiquity must do. And his study of Plato is therefore, um, it's, you know, not without criticism and it's not without admiration, but whether you want to do one or the other, you have to address him, right? So, you know, Nietzsche calls Plato at times one of the treasures of the ancient world, and he considered his symposium among his favorite works. Nevertheless, Nietzsche's work is often described by Nietzsche himself as the struggle against Platonism, against the theoretical optimism of Socrates, against Plato's political utopianism, and against Platonism's otherworldly aspects and inherently metaphysical aspects. And so here in approvingly inv invoking the sophist school against Platonism by setting the courage of Thucydides against the cowardice of Plato and defining Thucydides as someone who expresses sophist culture, Nietzsche affiliates himself and his project definitively with the rejection of Platonism and with the counterposition of the sophists. And rather than any of the caricatured sophist representatives that we encounter in a platonic dialogue, People like Thrasymachus, for example, who's rude and uh, just you know greedy and dismissive and contemptible in every way, the way that Plato writes him, Nietzsche says that the proper representative that we should look to is Thucydides, not a sophist philosopher, mind you, but Thucydides, the historian, hinting at the fact that what sophism is, properly considered, was not simply philosophy in the narrow sense of the discipline that we think about it today, but the pursuit of knowledge and included all the disciplines of knowledge. Thucydides, in terms of how he views geopolitics and how he views history, he is what we would call today a realist. Thucydides is so often interpreted as a realist that this interpretation almost goes without saying when discussing him. And yet, what isn't often mentioned, or maybe not as often mentioned as it should be, is that the first major writer to characterize Thucydides as a realist was Nietzsche. As David Polanski points out, the association of the term realist with Thucydides we owe to Nietzsche, and not to Hobbes or to Machiavelli, with whom the Thucydides is often compared. And so it might be another, um, you know, I don't know, I guess obvious thing to say to begin by pointing out that Thucydides is the first realist historian of the ancient world, but even this fact is relevant to the Nietzsche podcast because this interpretation begins with Nietzsche. The opposition between Platonism and Sophism can be stated in the simplest terms, then, as being analogous to the opposition between moralism and realism. The reason why Nietzsche associates Thucydides, um, why him specifically with the culture of the Sophists, is very well put in the thesis I found um, by Tristan Nicholas Thompson, which I will link in the show notes because it was a very helpful work in putting this episode together. Thompson writes, quote, A sophistic understanding of morality, in the simplest terms, centers on the relativity of morals, the idea that morality has no real concrete and universal existence, and that morality is thus a fragile and changeable human construct. By following Nietzsche's picture of Thucydides as the highest expression of sophist culture to its fullest extent, 
we are able to answer the moral question of Thucydides' history and to perceive a work that is itself a bold and challenging statement on the nature of morality, while containing relatively little explicit commentary on questions of right and wrong. End quote. So Thompson's argument about what the highest expression of sophist culture means is that Thucydides is a great man of knowledge in his own discipline who does not pursue that knowledge out of moralism. We might recall Nietzsche's aphorism in The Gay Science where he celebrates life as a means to knowledge and knowledge as sort of a domain for struggle, for achievement, and he rebukes the idea of it being a path to virtue or a bed to rest on. Nietzsche describes this revelation of approaching life as a sort of uh, a struggle, as a means to knowledge, as a great liberator for him. Um, that is arguably the sophist approach to life also. Then in Twilight of Idols, in the passage we read at the beginning, Nietzsche ties together what sophism means to him, which he defines in contrast with Platonism. Um, and so through his dichotomy of sophism versus Platonism, we understand also who Thucydides is to Nietzsche, right? And who he sort of stands for, why he stands as an opposing figure to Plato. Uh, it's worth noting the way that Thompson describes sophist morality could be applied to Nietzsche himself as well. I mean, Nietzsche's philosophy, it's characterized by these bold and challenging statements in the nature of morality, and he puts forward meta-ethical theories and statements about the origin and the function of morality, um, both in a historical and a psychological sense. He does comparative moral philosophy and so on. But as with Thucydides, he also doesn't really give explicit, explicit um, commentary on questions of right and wrong, insofar as he doesn't really believe in a prescriptive, like rule-based moral theory. And often, oftentimes, um, he doesn't seem to believe that there is a clear universal sort of like context transcendent answer to moral questions, you might say, right? And so, um, you know, I could see counter arguments uh, uh, about this based on, you know, various interpretations of will to power that people might have that Nietzsche maybe could be contrived into a prescriptive moral framework. But that doesn't really concern us here. The key thing is that morality systems of rules for governing human action is asserted by Nietzsche to be a product of the human mind rather than something transcendent coming from outside and above the human mind. And so what he sees in Thucydides is therefore a forerunner of his own work, someone to whom Nietzsche feels he owes a great deal because he's also thinking in those same extra moral terms, we might say. Uh, Thucydides is the counter to the Platonist view of the world because it's a realist view of human relations and human action. You know, uh, Plato in his dialogues, he's famous for crafting allegories and stories, even as he ad admits that some of what he includes should be regarded as simply a necessary fiction or a useful myth. Socrates goes through like the list of lines from famous Greek dramas that we should change or get rid of, you know, stories of the gods that shouldn't be told, suggesting that, um, you know, that the god should always be portrayed in a virtuous or good way, right? So, the, the myth is uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the truthfulness of whether the myth is real or not, right? It's uh, you should present um, the gods in such a way that they are presented as virtuous. And so Plato's project is always sort of driven by the desire to like alter the stories we tell in order to fit the moral rule, right? Um, that's why Nietzsche describes it as sort of uh, it's Aesopian, right? It's simply a moral, maxim um, put into story form. Thucydides, on the other hand, tries to discover the truth of the matter, to tell the story as it really happened, um, regardless of what the moral implications might be, rather than conform the story to the moral rule, right? And so we distill the moral from the true story, from what actually happened, um, regardless of what it is. And so in this attempt to understand events and people in those realistic terms, the defining aspect for Thucydides as with Nietzsche, is power. This is the principle that's driving the conflict that Thucydides writes about, the, um, the geopolitical struggle between Athens and Sparta, right? And the, the Peloponnesian War in which Sparta ultimately defeats Athens. Perhaps the most important observation of Thucydides in explaining the emergence of this conflict um, is a concept which has been, it's been made very famous in recent years. It's called the uh, Thucydides Trap, which we'll discuss in a bit. But um, we may note that what the, the sort of the driving causal factors in creating a Thucydides trap uh, involve power and a power relationship, right? 
Okay, so as for Thucydides himself, who was he? From all accounts, he was a Thracian or someone descended from Thracians. Uh, we get this impression from the fact that he says he owned mines in Thrace, and his father's name was said by Herodotus to be associated with Thrace. There's also an anecdote that the young Thucydides actually met Herodotus and heard him discourse on history, and in that moment decided that uh, he also wanted to be a historian. As for why Thucydides seems to be regarded as a better candidate for first true historian than Herodotus, well, in Herodotus we have all sorts of spurious tales. We have folklore and legends that Herodotus picked up in his travels and repeats uncritically at times. We have events attributed to gods and monsters and so on and so forth. Thucydides' standards of evidence seem to be higher. He was present for many of the events that occurred, giving first-hand accounts, or at least able to relate the accounts of men who were there. And while he mentions at the beginning of his work that there were unusual signs and portents, right, such as e eclipses and unusual astrological events, um, it's not exactly supernatural, right? It's entirely possible that this was actually the case. More importantly, Thucydides says, though, that he doesn't attribute causal relationships to the will of the gods, um, but portrays a conflict between human motives and human actors. Um, and in fact, Thucydides relates a couple accounts in which, you know, the party, it, one of the parties to the events in question regarded some sign like the full moon as a symbol that the gods were on their side and then went on to like lose spectacularly, right? So he definitely doesn't conform the narrative to um, showing the gods in control. It's quite the opposite. Um, now, he had firsthand involvement with the conflict because he was an Athenian strategos or general. Um, unfortunately for Thucydides, he was ultimately exiled from Athens for losing a battle that he was not present for. Uh, when the Spartans attacked Amphipolis, Thucydides was sent um, to defend the city, but fearing the Athenian reinforcements that were, you know, hastily arriving, the Spartans decided to just simply negotiate with the Amphipolis, who accepted the terms. And so when Thucydides arrived with the reinforcements, the Spartan general Brasidas had already taken over the city, and Thucydides was, unfortunately for him, blamed for this, even though he, the city was lost before he arrived, and he was exiled from Athens for a period of 20 years. And so Thucydides relates his account of how this all happened in the text itself, and it's treated with neutral detachment, as with every other event in the book. But one of the things that Thucydides, therefore, has going for him in terms of being able to achieve this neutrality springs from the fact that he was in exile for the latter half of the war. And so he witnesses events firsthand from the Athenian perspective at the beginning of the conflict. And then after he's exiled, he's free to move amongst the Peloponnesian city-states and to attain their perspective in the conflict. So other than these things I've already told you, um, we don't really know much about him. That's pretty much it, right? What we have in the text um, are about all the details we know about Thucydides, and the personal details are scant because he's not writing a book about himself, but he's writing a book about this great conflict. Um, now, we'll examine this association between Thucydides and the Sophists a bit more because I think it's really significant even beyond Thucydides himself before we sort of dive into the text here. Um, we're going to look at a passage from Daybreak entitled A Model, in which the connection between Thucydides and the Sophists is further explained. So Nietzsche writes, this is in Aphorism 168, quote, How does it come that I esteem Thucydides more highly than Plato? He exhibits the most widespread and artless pleasure in everything typical in men and events, and finds that each type is possessed of a certain quantity of good sense. It is this good sense which he seeks to discover. He likewise exhibits a larger amount of practical justice than Plato. He never reviles or belittles those men whom he dislikes or who have in any way injured him in the course of his life. On the contrary, while seeing only types, he introduces something noble and additional into all things and persons. For what could posterity, to which he dedicates his work, do with things not typical? Thus this culture of the disinterested knowledge of the world attains in him, the poet-thinker, a final mar marvelous bloom. 
this culture which has its poet in Sophocles, its statesman in Pericles, its doctor in Hippocrates, and its natural philosopher in Democritus, this culture which deserves to be called by the name of its teachers, the Sophists, and which, unhappily, from the moment of its baptism at once begins to grow pale and incomprehensible to us, for henceforward we suspect that this culture, which was combated by Plato and all the Socratic schools, must have been very immoral. The truth of this matter is so complicated and entangled that we feel unwilling to unravel it, so let the old error, error veritate simplicitor, run its course. In end quote. Excuse me. Um, so a lot of very fascinating things in that passage. I mean, we have the obvious orientation of Nietzsche's um, he, he's always oriented around the great individual as the real fruit of the culture. And so he describes the Greek culture as having its statesman in Pericles, its doctor in Hippocrates, its poet in Sophocles, and so on. Notice who the archetypal philosopher is, Democritus. Um, if we consider Nietzsche's work on the pre-Platonic philosophers, in which Democritus is correlated with Boscovich, he's sort of held up alongside the later Pythagoreans as the pinnacle of this materialist, um, emerging materialist philosophy uh, that was coming into being in Greece in this era. Um, so, you know, Democritus is, he's like the zenith of Greek philosophy because he is the culmination of this struggle toward materialism, right? A struggle out of the scattered wisdom of folklore and the oracular revelations of the priests. Uh and so, you know, at the end of that process, the archetype can emerge, right? The the type of the philosopher, the greatest achievement in the the discipline of knowledge. Um, and so, you know, elsewhere in his work around this period, Nietzsche talks about how the wealth of great individuals that Greece had was simply unmatched, in his opinion, unmatched anywhere in the ancient or modern world. That, you know, he says, we Germans have really nothing to compare with the Greeks in this respect. And so... That's how he uses the great individual framework here. Um, each extraordinary individual comes to stand for the excellence or character of an entire discipline, an entire domain of human achievement. Um, key to this is this aspect of Greek society that Nietzsche talks about in the essay Homer's Contest, the agon, the competition. The understanding of friendship is something characterized by rivalry, jealousy, the desire to become better than those of your peer rank a constant struggle to become the best. And so the Greek culture prior to Platonism is this culture of greatness created by rivalry and competition. This is the defining feature of the Greek aristocratic feeling. And Nietzsche notes that by our modern standards, this culture must have been accordingly rather immoral. And that's a puzzle that he puts before himself to solve, a riddle that he hadn't really yet solved when he's studying as a classical philologist. Um, but that he eventually ends up, he eventually rejects the side of morality and Platonism, right? And throws in his lot with the, um, the immoral school of the sophists, right? Because if that's what immorality is, look how beautiful it all is. Maybe it would be a flippant way to put it. But, you know, Nietzsche really said, thinks that the classical Hellenic civilization is defined as a culture of the sophists. And he argues this because the sophists were their teachers. The word means expert or doctor in the sense of being an academic or a teacher. And they're, by all accounts, amoral. You know, they're criticized by Socrates and Plato for taking payment for the instruction in philosophy. You know, in, in other words, for teaching a dispassionate, disinterested knowledge about the world with no moral element, right? Without a moralistic pretense. The, remember, Socrates seeks the truth in order to do the good. The sophists are not doing that. They're, they're not seeking the truth in order to do the good. They're simply instructing um, those who pay them in the knowledge that they can offer them, right? And so the famous um, you know, critique of the sophists is that they are teachers of rhetoric and that you know, they treated rhetorical skill as like any other skill. Um, it's not part of some greater moral project to seek the truth, simply your ability to persuade, to make others see your point of view or to compel them to your perspective. Um, and Socrates condemns this as fundamentally immoral, right? And it's like sort of proof of the unwisdom of the sophists because they're willing to teach techniques of, you know, speaking and persuading with no regard of what relationship those techniques had to the truth, meaning that they're sort of like unleashing um, 
this dangerous power and putting it into the hands of falsehood and what could be more dangerous to society, right? And so what Nietzsche concludes, therefore, is that within the Greek Aegon prior to Socrates, there naturally existed a plethora of viewpoints. The, the, you know, the symposium, the touchstone or test of the aristocratic uh, soul, the symposium was a place to bring one's perspective, whether philosophical, political, or aesthetic, sort of to bring it into competition with other viewpoints. That was the contest of the symposium, contrasting and conflicting um, viewpoints or perspectives or simply um, contrasting expressions, contrasting um, manifestations of one's ability. Um, and so this was a celebrated aspect of Greek culture where they would uh, debate, they would um, um, compete in readings of uh, poetry or in singing of poetic verses. But the most natural thing in the world for them was this sort of sophistic view of the truth, this perspectival, manifold view of the truth, um, this conflict and contrast that was normal. And this is the same world that Thucydides inhabits and that he describes, right? Rather than finding good guys and bad guys in the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, what we see in Thucydides is a description of powers with competing interests, which lead then into competing moral views that are sort of post hoc on the back of those interests. So the implication might be that a moral view that someone holds is a rationalization to cast a more favorable light on the course of action that suits their own interest. Rather than portraying the men he likes in flattering terms, though, and portraying the people he doesn't like as buffoons or, you know, rude, which is what Plato does, Thucydides he demonstrates a capacity for what Nietzsche calls in that above passage, practical justice, right? He does justice to the people and events by portraying them with this dispassionate, sophistic approach and to, to make every man a type and thus see the reason, uh, uh, to see the sort of logic of what a different type of person or what, what your logic would be if you're coming from a given background where you have a certain set of things that will give you an advantage how are you going to <laughs> rationalize that into a moral position, right? And so he presents everyone this way. He tries to um, offer up the all these different competing incompatible perspectives. Um, to put it in simple terms, he's fair. He doesn't do people the injustice of measuring them against his own universal moral standard. He lets them speak for themselves and he lets multiple conflicting viewpoints exist within the text. Uh, we'll return to the work of Thompson. He writes, quote, This concept of competitive truths forms an important locus between the ethical thought of the sophists, Nietzsche, and Thucydides. The courage in the face of reality that Nietzsche ascribes to Thucydides in What I Owe to the Ancients refers especially to his refusal to flee into the ideal, to the realm of universal values. Instead, Thucydides stands firm in the confusing, conflicted reality of competing moral claims inhabited by the sophists, end quote. And uh, near the end of the essay, Thomas then goes on to give us this excellent insight in which we find a kinship between Thucydides and the wisdom of somebody like Heraclitus, who said that war is the father of all. Thompson writes that, quote, we are told that war, the object of Thucydides' relentless and penetrating inquiry, is a baeos, did, didaskalos, a harsh teacher. I contend that to understand Thucydides' history, it is necessary to divorce the personal moral, moral opinions of Thucydides, his views on what actions and standards of conduct would yield the best results for states and individuals in a given situation, from the moral message of the history the disclosure of the moral home truths made apparent by the harsh teacher. End quote. And so by this token, Thompson sort of dismisses the many interpretations that emphasize, you know, Thucydides as making a moral condemnation against, for example, you know, like the Corsirians for what happens in the course of the war, or like lamenting the decay of old traditions and beliefs. And I think Thompson is correct about that, that Thucydides is actively attempting to separate his writing from those motivations. And he's writing for a higher order motivation, if you will, and that is a philosophical motivation, not in the narrow sense, but in more of a broad sense, in a sophistic sense, right? The desire to distill that moral lesson 
moral here in the sense of prudence, or virtue in the Renaissance sense, vertu in terms of expediency. He's trying to distill this lesson from the most extreme study of human experience and human action and motivation, which is and has always been war. It's a moral lesson as it shows us how people actually behave, where the stakes are the highest and the rewards are the greatest, and in this extreme environment, the pretenses of moralism are dropped in favor of expediency. Codes of conduct which are established according to custom always end up yielding to this brute necessity of defeating the enemy and winning the conflict because the alternative is death or slavery or whatever it might be. And so here we see what people really value, how they really think one ought to act, regardless of the pretty words we might say about morality when in the safety of peacetime. And so the Peloponnesian War in the simplest sense this is a drawn-out conflict between these two city-states of Athens and Sparta. They're the two greatest cities within the Hellenic civilization. But to describe the conflict with a little more granularity, I mean, there were countless cities involved because virtually all of the Hellenic world participated. In some ways, the circumstances leading up to the war might remind us of, for example, World War I, to use a modern allegory, right? There were alliances maintained by Athens, and alliances maintained by Sparta, and the Peloponnesian War begins when a city is claimed by both an ally of Sparta, the Corinthians, and another city which is rival to, to them, the Corsirians. So Corinth is a great naval power, meaning that the Corsirians have the odds stacked against them, but Corinth's na navy is not as great as Athens, um, and Athens' entire league of allies, right? And so in facing the Corinthians, the Corsirians appeal to Athens, and Corsira, which was formerly neutral, joins a defensive pact with Athens. The Athenians then go to defend it, and the Corinthians you know, warn them that by doing so, they'll be flirting with open war with Sparta, but the Athenians cannot be dissuaded. And this sparks off a chain of events in which Sparta, in retaliation, incites rebellions in Athenian colonies. The Athenians thwart the Corinthian navy, and both the Spartan and Athenian alliances sort of push one another in various ways until the Spartans, hearing the pleas of their various allies in the Peloponnese, finally agree to go to war against Athens. Athens receives this challenge and answers it with her own declaration of war. And so it may appear in terms of like the structure or the pattern of events that take place at the start of the war, that it's just these two great powers being drawn into conflict with one another due to their obligations to their allies or something like that, right? But that's, in fact, not what Thucydides says about the conflict. That rather what he says, that what's actually happening is that it's an inexorable drive toward conflict between these two powers because Athens has grown increasingly powerful in previous years. And it seems bound to establish itself as the head of an, a Hellenic empire. And so this is the famous Thucydides trap that an existing great power of Sparta and this rising power, Athens, they always inevitably find themselves in conflict as the new power continues to ascend. That peace is not possible in this situation when a great power's status as such is threatened by the ascendancy of a rival. And so in the case of Athens and Sparta, there's a reason why the two powers find themselves in this situation but it doesn't have to do with this network of alliances so much. That's, in some sense, uh, just a matter of course. The, really, the underlying cause has to do with the Median War, or the war against the Persians, you could say. This is a very famous and popular event in Greek history, commemorated in that great work of art, uh, the movie 300 by Zack Snyder. <laughs> but, you know, the war with the Persians which happened prior to this, it saw an alliance of many Greek city-states against a foreign threat. And oftentimes, within Thucydides' work, the Persians are sort of interchangeably called barbarians, right? So in spite of all the cultural interaction between the Greeks and the Persians, they were considered a definitively foreign people. And their march into Greece sort of prompted this combined Greek effort to drive them back, culminating in the Battle of Plataea. You may remember from uh, Fustel de Collonges' work that when a person died, according to their ancient traditions, their soul continued living in the body underground, right? And this belief is what established the ritual of providing food and drink at the burial site of the dead. <laughs> 
Well, after the vast numbers of slain, you know, soldiers at Plataea in the final confrontation of the Persian War, the bodies were so many and from so many different places that the people of Plataea were sort of asked to just perform a yearly funeral repast for the dead soldiers there, rather than everyone trying to go and claim all their dead from just the thousands and thousands of dead. So the people of Plataea would walk out onto where the battlefield was and pour out wine and leave bread and cakes or burn a sheep or goat and leave, you know, dead soldiers, you know, the burned flesh of the victim. Um, Historians say that people of Plataea did this for even many years afterwards. Um, Now, in this sort of aftermath of the Persian War, which set the stage for the Peloponnesian War, you know, in the Median War, the war with the Persians, Athens and Sparta were allies. But in after the Persian War was over, the power of Athens had grown immensely. And the reason for this is that Athens had followed the route of a naval power in attempting to attain greatness. Um, so they sort of avoided competing with the Spartans for having the best land-based military. Um Instead, they made allies of many of the people who were islanders, um, many of whom, you know, Thucydides tells us these peoples were historically great pirates. (laughs) Um, So Sparta, you know, they're known as the Lacedaemonians, and I will use the term Sparta or Lacedaemon or whatever interchangeably here. But they're fearsome warriors trained from birth, and they have famously efficient military techniques. And their infantry just dominates on land. But you know, when it comes to the sea, um, they really have nothing on Athens, right? In the course of trying to secure the Aegean Sea, Athens establishes the Delian League, an alliance of coastal city-states. And while it was in theory an alliance among equals, Athens is the undisputed leader of the League, and their influence through this League stretches throughout all, all, all of Greece. And with their sailors being, you know, among the finest uh, among the Greeks and with all of these other naval powers on their side, there's really no one who can challenge them in the water. But Corinth, uh, meanwhile, that was the ally of Sparta that helps to spark off the conflict. They were also a naval power, and in recent years, they've become completely overshadowed by Athens and by the Delian League. And so the perspective that Thucydides gives on the conflict is that Corinth's naval ambitions demanded a clash with Athens, and Athens, meanwhile, couldn't abide this challenge to their naval power lest they look like a paper tiger, right? Which demands that they then answer the challenge in kind, they can't back down, and in turn Sparta has to come to the aid of their allies or else they would simply be letting the Athenians do as they please, and that would make Sparta look weak, right? And so their allies argue fiercely for retribution for Athens defeating the Corinthians. Um, and while the king of Sparta, Archidamus, sort of urges caution, uh, the Spartan allies and the Spartan nobility don't really seem to go for this. And one of the ephors, who are the sort of the priests of the city, gives a fiery speech against the Athenians and the majority vote to go to war. Now, the Spartans make their demands of Athens, and I think the negotiation of these terms could have avoided the conflict, but the Athenians decide, after one of the famous orations of Pericles, that they cannot have terms dictated to them by Sparta, no matter how acceptable that they may find them, right? And so, in short, both sides have to continuously employ the same reasoning, that if they give in to what their rival wants them to do, they'll be displaying subordination to them. And the minute that one of them does this, it would be effectively handing over the reins of Greece to their opponent because to show subordination is to place them above you, right? And so both sides are incentivized to constantly defy and oppose the other simply as a matter of course. And so neither can countenance the demands of the other no matter how reasonable, and it makes the situation increasingly tense. And so in such a mindset, peace cannot really reasonably be maintained. And eventually the contest between these two powers will be forced to manifest itself in open warfare. What had kept the series of sieges and blockades and revolts incited during this initial period of conflict from escalating into an all-out war 
was uh, eventually a treaty of non-aggression, which is struck by Pericles and the Spartan king Archidamus. But nevertheless, it doesn't even last half the amount of time that it was negotiated for, and the treaty is quickly broken. The peace was not simply bitter for these two sides, but intolerable. And so Thucydides writes, quote, To the question of why they broke the treaty, I answer by placing first an account of their grounds of complaint and points of difference, that no one may ever have to ask the immediate cause which plunged the Hellenes into a war of such magnitude. The real cause I consider to be the one which was formerly most kept out of sight, the growth of the power of Athens, and the alarm which this inspired in Lacedaemon made war inevitable." End quote. The war begins in earnest with the Spartans making their assault upon Attica, which is the land where Athens is located. The Athenians, however, had expected this, and in the decades prior to the outbreak of the uh, main conflict, had taken measures to protect themselves. Years prior, the general Themistocles, who had led the Athenians against the Persians, and who was even well-loved by the Spartans for his prowess in battle during that war, had done everything possible to make Athens the greatest naval power in Greece, and he had also ordered the very rapid construction of the walls of Athens. Sparta, of course, desired that none of the Greek city-states should have such walls, which would prevent the taking of the city by means of infantry. This type of attitude, I think, sometimes confuses those of us who are not acquainted with warfare, because, after all, walls are a purely defensive structure, so what threat could they pose to Sparta? But if your opponent can't, you know, if, if your opponent can't be punished by your attacks, right, it makes it so he, he can behave as he pleases, doesn't it? An insurmountable defense puts the two cities on uneven footing. And so this was during a period of what was essentially proxy warfare between Athens and Sparta, as well as, you know, Athens antagonizing the Corinthians by block blockading their trade routes and so on and so forth. Um, a period sometimes called the First Peloponnesian War, but which is really just sort of like the buildup to the broader conflict. And so during this time, Themistocles had used his prestige among the Spartans to sort of... Um, distract their attention while he ordered the swift construction of the walls of Piraeus so that Sparta didn't act preemptively to try and stop them from building the walls. And having succeeded, these walls not only protected Athens, but linked it by a walled corridor to the port of Piraeus, which meant that Athens could be always be supplied by sea, no matter what happened on the land around them, which meant the city couldn't be surrounded and starved out by a siege. Uh, effectively within these walls, so long as Athens maintained command of the Aegean Sea, their city could never be taken. So now, decades later, with these walls in place, the Athenians simply called everyone from the countryside into the safety of Athens, while the Spartans uh, approached with their invasion force. The Spartans ravaged the countryside. They went around burning, you know, farmlands, um, just pillaging, destroying anything they could. The Spartans may have thought that perhaps they could goad the Athenians into coming out and sort of uh, giving battle. And Thucydides reports that many within the city wished to march out and stop the despoiling of their lands. He says, quote, The territory of Athens was being ravaged before the very eyes of the Athenians, a sight which the young men had never seen before, and the old only in the Median Wars. And it was naturally thought a grievous insult and the determination was universal, especially among the young men, to sally forth and stop it, end quote. But the Athenian general Pericles um, once again sort of took charge. He knew this was a mistake. In spite of the popular agitation uh, with Pericles, you know, for not challenging the Spartan infantry, uh, given the information available, it was probably the correct decision, right? The Athenians had ensured that they had enough food and supplies coming in from Egypt, coming in from Asia Minor, and they could simply wait out the Spartan king, Archidamus, while he raided and burned and pillaged. And since they had enough supplies, the Spartan offensive basically failed to have any effect due to the cool head of uh, Pericles. It was in this context that Pericles gave his famous funerary oration. It was customary to give such uh, speeches in honor of the noble dead. And the Greeks, you know, they use the term eulogium, which is where we get the term eulogy. And while one could, you know, historically sort of also eulogize the living, uh, 
This is the context in which the Greek term eulogium had roughly the same function as our own eulogies today, uh, which we give at funerals, right? So Pericles had to fulfill his duty as the leading politician and strategos of Athens in giving this speech. But in the context of what's sort of going on in the background, right, Thucydides has told us how the citizenry is irritated with Pericles' rule, how a lot of people blame him for the suffering, tra- you know, that they're enduring trapped behind the walls of Athens while their homeland is destroyed. And so Pericles uses this speech not simply as a means of honoring the dead, but of stirring valor and patriotism. Uh, most importantly, he gives a meaning to the conflict between Athens and Sparta, not as simply a great powers competition, but as a contest between democracy and oligarchy. And that is the subtext of his speech, that the themes of his famous funeral oration are that Athens is like the school of the Hellenes, it's the most educated and cultured city, and that the reason for this is that they've expanded their democratic franchise to any man, and so they've allowed all to compete for greatness within their city. And so Pericles, he not only provides a demonstration of how a politician leads uh, during a crisis by sort of trying to stir the hearts of their constituents, but he also provides his people with a greater meaning to the defense of Athens in the context of which they might find the strength to continue the conflict, even in this dark hour, right? And so Pericles honors the Athenian dead by saying, quote, thus choosing to die resisting rather than to live submitting, they fled only from dishonor, but met danger face to face. And after one brief moment, while at the summit of their fortune escaped, not from their fear, but from their glory. So died these men as became Athenians. You, their survivors, must determine to have as unfaltering a resolution in the field, though you may pray that it may have a happier issue. And not contented with ideas derived only from words of the advantages which are bound up with the defense of your country, though these would furnish a valuable text to a speaker even before an audience so alive to them as the present, You must yourselves realize the power of Athens and feed your eyes upon her from day to day till love of her fills your hearts. And then when all her greatness shall break upon you, you must reflect that it was by courage, sense of duty, and a keen feeling of honor and action that men were enabled to win all this and that no personal failure in an enterprise could make them consent to deprive their country of their valor, but they laid it at her feet as the most glorious contribution that they could offer." For this offering of their lives made in common by them, all they each of them individually received that renown which never grows old, and for a sepulchre, not so much that in which their bones have been deposited, but that noblest of shrines wherein their glory is laid up to be eternally remembered upon every occasion on which deed or story shall call for its commemoration. For heroes have the whole earth for their tomb and in lands far from their own, where the column with its epitaph declares it, there is enshrined in every breast a record unwritten with no tablet to preserve it, except that of the heart. These take as your model, and judging happiness to be the fruit of freedom, and freedom of valor, never decline the dangers of war. End quote. That's a very short extract of the full speech, which Thucydides records. Although Thucydides does tell us he uh, had to, at times, summarize what was said and compile these speeches from multiple sources or to take liberties, Um, but that what he reports is overall in the spirit of what Pericles said, right? This speech of uh, Pericles, as I've mentioned, has become quite famous, with many other famous speeches influenced it, such as Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, to which it's been compared. Now, even though Sparta has ravaged Attica, the Spartan position at this point in the war is deceptively weak. The Athenians, with their naval power, were able to effectively blockade the Peloponnesian Peninsula and stop any foreign trade from coming to Sparta. During the winter, the Spartans therefore had to return to harvest their grains, or else the entirety of their lands would starve. And thus, owing to how they'd prepared themselves before the war, the land siege of Athens failed, And a naval siege began. Uh, They were able to take to the offensive, in which the Peloponnese were cut off from the rest of the world, and their only means of travel was by land. 
The Athenians then began to raid coastal cities allied to the Spartans, meaning that the armies of the Peloponnese also had to split their forces to defend the coastline and take up a defensive stance. With no fields to harvest themselves since the Spartans had burned them all and supplied from their allies in the Delian League and with grain from Egypt, Athens was able to go on the offensive accordingly. Um, and this was Pericles' plan all along. But uh, unfortunately for Pericles, and perhaps unfortunately for Athens, because who knows, this might have changed the whole course of the war, Athens was governed democratically, and by popular vote, they rejected the offensive strategy. Or they rejected, you know, they, they did some coastal raiding, as we've mentioned, but um, they wanted to, you know, do like a land, a land invasion of uh, the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the for Pericles' plan, no, this was voted down. And so popular sentiment had wished for rash action based on anger when a defensive stance had been called for earlier. And now when bold and audacious military maneuvering might have caught the Spartans at a weak point, the democratic sentiment had shifted to remain on the defensive. And while Pericles had been able to sort of stir the people to stay the course before, he was unable to convince the people to take up the offensive to the sufficient degree he wanted to. What happened next was a complete disaster for Athens. And uh, this was actually not owing to really any human action, but an act of the gods, if you will. To speak more materialistically, it was a reminder that we human beings are actually ruled over by the world of microorganisms. As it turns out, a plague was spreading throughout Egypt, and by importing Egyptian grain into the now densely packed city of Athens, uh, now holding the whole rural as well as urban population inside the walls, the Athenians had also imported a plague. Perhaps it came with the men on the ships who brought the grain, perhaps with the insects on the grain, perhaps rats that carry the insects, but this disease hit the Athenian population very hard. Thucydides was in the city when this plague arrived. Estimates of the infection fatality rate vary. Some say a fourth of all Athenians died, some say a third. Some estimates range as high as two-thirds. From what we understand, almost everyone got the disease. It seems to have been highly contagious, and it sickened the population and killed a great number. And mo most, most importantly, uh, in looking at the war, it completely demoralized the Athenians. Thucydides writes, quote, All speculation as to its origin and its causes, if causes can be found adequate to produce so great a disturbance, I leave to other writers, whether lay or professional. For myself, I shall simply set down its nature and explain the symptoms by which perhaps it may be recognized by the student if it should ever break out again. This I can the better do, as I had the disease myself and watched its operation in the case of others." End quote. He tells us how the plague began with a cough, then chest congestion and chest pains. He describes how the disease made the Athenians feverish, how they felt so hot that they tore off their clothes and wanted nothing but to throw themselves into cold water, and that many who were not properly attended did so. They also wanted nothing more than to drink up all the cold water they could find, but none of, none of this helped um, with their condition. And trapped as they were in close quarters, there was no avoiding the disease, and those healthy people who looked after the sick soon became sick themselves. And so people either languished from being uncared for, as they were avoided by the healthy, or else they, the healthy did try to take care of them, but then they quickly sickened their caretakers. Thucydides then provides us with an ancient account of immunity to the disease for those who recovered. Um, likely from, you know, antibodies developing. He writes, quote, Yet it was with those who had recovered from the disease that the sick and the dying found most compassion. These knew what it was from experience and now had no fear for themselves, for the same man was never attacked twice, never at least fatally. And such persons not only received the congratula congratulations of others, <clears throat> excuse me, but themselves also in the elation of the moment. Uh half entertained the vain hope that they were for the future safe from any disease whatsoever, end quote. Okay, so aside from all of the insight into geopolitics we get from Thucydides, 
this type of documentation is also valuable because with hindsight, we can see how such a firsthand fact-based account can inform the sciences and posterity. Um, that plagues are not curses of the divine, right? But an attack on the immune system for which one can gain immunity. And so Thucydides had no knowledge of germ theory personally, but it's a value of his historical spirit that, you know, his commitment to leave behind facts that allows for them to be later interpreted by people with new knowledge. I mean, this probably seems very obvious today, but again, um, we just have to remember that this historical spirit, like all things, had to be discovered. It wasn't obvious, right? Um, that such observations could be later valuable to people that have, would have knowledge as, that you don't have, right? And so out of fear of the plague, uh, to return to the story of the war, the Spartans withdrew from campaigning near Athens, really at all. And in a bit of dramatic irony, the well-planned-out Athenian strategy completely backfired in so, insofar as the um, Peloponnesians were protected from the plague by the Athenian naval blockade. The Athenians effectively quarantined the Spartans from the disease and meanwhile packed their entire population into a relatively small space in order to be ravaged by it. And so worst of all, the plague eventually kills Pericles, their great general. The Athenians still campaigned in the years following the breakout of the plague, but they were not nearly as successful as they probably would have been otherwise and it's reported that they brought the plague with them on their ships, and they were dying from it even as they traveled to go fight at other city-states. And so it wasn't until a few years later in the war that the Athenians were able to pick up steam with their offensive once again. Uh, the young, charismatic aristocrat named Cleon, who had formerly been an opponent of Pericles, rose to power at following Pericles' death. Under his leadership, the Athenians defeated the Spartans' Theban allies at Plataea. Cleon put down a rebellion of one of the cities of the Delian League on the island of Lesbos, and the Athenian general Demosthenes also led an expedition to defend Corsera and it ended up uh, fighting with the Spartan navy and the Spartan army at Pylos. And though they had fewer men and ships, their superiority in naval battle tactics um, allowed the Athenians to defeat the Spartans, and Demosthenes and his men survived the Spartan onslaught by making a fort out of their ships and holding off waves of hoplite attacks from a defensive stance. The Spartan general Brasidas was wounded during this battle, and the Athenians successfully um, defeated the Spartans in the Spartans' own territory. They took hundreds of Spartan hoplites prisoner, and many of these were the sons of leading families of the, the city. Um, and they essentially held these Spartan prisoners hostage and threatened their execution if the Spartans ever attacked Attica again. Uh, with this, Cleon was celebrated as a hero to the Athenians, and the Spartans withdrew from campaigning against them. Um, around this time, we also have Thucydides record um, another struggle between oligarchy and democracy as it played out in Corsera, one of the cities that had sparked off the conflict to begin with. Now that the war had raged for some time, the nobility of Corsera, who were closer in political philosophy to the Lacedaemonians, desired to be free of Athenian influence and became more aligned with the Peloponnesian alliance. Um, and so this was a, a common thing, as we've talked about, that the aristocracies were often more friendly to Sparta, and the popular democratic sentiment, the people of the various cities, were often more friendly to Athens. So even though Corsera had asked for the aid of Athens in fighting the Corinthians, and that had sort of led to this whole war, now the oligarchy or the aristocracy of uh, Corsera has sort of buyer's remorse, and they would like to go over to the Spartan side, which will always protect the rights of the oligarchy, right? Um, and so there were also those that Thucydides reports who resented feeling drawn into a war on behalf of the Athenians and felt that they'd been subordinated to the Delian League. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, the common people, the democratic parties, uh, see Athens as more amenable to their interests. But internal strife and polarization therefore begins to grip the city. And it experiences what's often called a stasis, where it becomes unable to meaningfully act or express its power. 
such that when the Athenians send ships to ensure that the city will stay loyal to Athens and stay as part of the Delian League. Um, And so, you know, the Athenians send ships to help the Corsarians defend themselves, right? So the Corsarians um, come out and they're there to bolster the Corsarian ships. The Athians find that the Corsarian ships are totally ineffective in battle because the crews on the ships are actually divided between those with competing ideologies. And so the Athenian ships flee as the Corsarians basically go into mutiny and little miniature civil wars on their own ships and are completely unable to defend themselves. Um, And when rumors abound of a Peloponnesian fleet approaching, fear grips the city. Fortunately, the fleet chooses not to attack Corsera, but flees in fear of a larger approaching Athenian fleet um, because, you know, the Athenians were sending reinforcements. But at this point in the social situation of the city, the tension sort of reaches a fever pitch and Thucydides reports that the faction of commoners then attacked the aristocratic faction within the city. He writes, quote, The Corsarians were engaged in butchering those of their fellow citizens whom they regarded as their enemies. And although the crime imputed was that of attempting to put down the democracy, some were slain also for private hatred, others by their debtors because of the monies owed to them. Death thus raged in every shape, and as usually happens at such times, there was no length to which violence did not go. Sons were killed by their fathers, and suppliants dragged from the altar or slain upon it, while some were even walled up in the temple of Dionysus and died there. Thucydides reports that this is not really an isolated incident, but there were just revolutions everywhere. Uh, The aristocracies would always call for the aid of the Spartans and the Democrats for the aid of the Athenians. And so, in the context of this conflict, both of them would answer. Um, as much for their political philosophy as for their own advantage in the conflict. And so Thucydides continues, quote, So bloody was the march of the revolution, and the impression which it made was the greater as it was one of the first to occur. Later on, one may say, the whole Hellenic world was convulsed, struggles being everywhere, made by the popular chiefs to bring in the Athenians, and by the oligarchs to introduce the Lacedaemonians. In peace, there would have been neither the pretext nor the wish to make such an invitation, but in war, with an alliance always at the command of either faction, for the hurt of their adversaries and their own corresponding advantage, opportunities for bringing in the foreigner were never wanting to the revolutionary parties. End quote. So, for the time being, it seemed that Athens had the upper hand in the conflict, and what tended to happen in the course of this decades-long conflict between these powers is that when one started to gain advantage over the other, cities that were formerly neutral would join the winner, and cities that were allied with the loser would suddenly become neutral or uh, join the other side. Um, This is sort of the process that keeps the conflict always hot. There's almost always a polis somewhere attempting to leave and go to the other side that prompts a response from the opposing power, right? which then necessitates that the other get involved also. And so the city of Delium, formerly under the control of Thebes, decides to leave the Thebans and join the Delian League. This is because of Athens' superior footing in the war at this point. Demosthenes, therefore, goes to fight the Thebans for control of the city, and due to the creativity of the Thebans, the Athenians actually lose. And this shows how fickle your reputation can be or how fickle the perceptions of others can be because when they lose to the Thebans, it makes the Athenians seem less unstoppable, right? They'd sort of surprised everyone by coming out and really, um, even in spite of the plague and everything that had happened, beating back the Spartans and even going on the offensive against them. But Thebes doesn't even need help from the Spartans to defeat the Athenians, And so while Delium switching sides was a sign of Athenian dominance in the war, by failing to defend that new possession against the the Thebans and their contest over the city of Delium, the Athenians demonstrated weakness, and it emboldened Sparta. In the meantime, Brasidas, the Spartan general, marches on Amphipolis with his Thracian allies. The Thracians, uh, you know, uh, are traditionally more aligned with Sparta, and um, the 
Amphipolis are an Athenian colony, right? And so this is the incident in which Thucydides himself, our narrator, loses his uh, prestige among his fellow Athenians, and he records it here. Quote, Brasidas, afraid of succors arriving by sea from Thasos, learned that Thucydides possessed the right of working the gold mines in that part of Thrace, and had thus great influence with the inhabitants of the continent, and hastened to gain the town, if possible, before the people of Amphipolis should be encouraged by his arrival to hope that he could save them by getting together a force of allies from the sea and from Thrace, and so to refuse to surrender. He accordingly offered moderate terms, proclaiming that any of the Amphipolitans and Athenians who chose might continue to enjoy their property with full rights of citizenship, while those who did not wish to stay had five days to depart, taking their property with them. The bulk of the inhabitants, upon hearing this, began to change their minds, especially as only a small number of the citizens were Athenians, the majority having come from different quarters, and many of the prisoners outside had relations within the walls. They had found the proclamation a fair one in comparison to what their fear had suggested, the Athenians being glad to go out, as they thought they ran more risk than the rest, and further did not expect any speedy relief, and the multitude generally being content at being left in possession of their civic rights, and at such an unexpected reprieve from danger. The partisans of Brasidas now openly advocated this course, seeing that the feeling of the people had changed, and that they no longer gave ear to the Athenian general present. And thus the surrender was made, and Brasidas was admitted by them on the terms of his proclamation. And this way they gave up the city, and late in the same day Thucydides and his ships entered the harbor of Aeon, Brasidas having just got hold of Amphipolis, and having been within a night of taking Aeon, had the ships been less prompt in relieving it, in the morning it would have been his. End quote. And so on the other side of that coin, if Thucydides had just been a day earlier, right, he might have inspired the Amphipolitans to fight. Um, but as it happened, the city surrendered before he arrived. So the loss of Amphipolis frightened everyone in Athens because of the resources provided by the town. The town supplied timber to Athens for shipbuilding, which was absolutely essential to maintain the Athenian navy. And it was a source of uh, revenue also. And so following these victories, Brasidas pushed forward into Athenian territory, and the Athenians began to suffer revolt after revolt among their colonies and allies can understand why the Athenians might wish to blame someone for their problems, and that's exactly what they did by banishing Thucydides. And so perhaps we should be grateful that they, they did that because it afforded him that switch of perspective on the war that proved so valuable. Now, the hero Cleon went out to meet Brasidas in battle. Brasidas managed to outmaneuver Cleon, anticipating his counterattack, and caught the Athenians unprepared. Both generals were killed during the clash, but the Spartans won an overwhelming military victory. The Athenians, having succeeded against all odds in the beginning of the conflict, due to their mastery of the sciences of warfare, of you know naval battle and ship construction and strategy, they had succeeded against soldiers that were perhaps one of the most effective infantry fighting forces on earth, but Athens was never the undisputed superior at infantry combat, and thus when they started losing on the ground, and seeing their empire that supplied them with resources begin to be threatened, they had to make concessions. They knew they would not be able to ultimately defeat Sparta in a protracted land battle. Uh, the Spartans, meanwhile, had figured out they couldn't attack Athens directly because of the hostages, but that their walls wouldn't matter if they took out the colonies that supplied the city. This set of circumstances led to the negotiation of an armistice, what was called the 50-year peace of Nicias. Nicias was the Athenian general who had led the successful attack against the Thebans in the earlier part of the war. Now he negotiated with the interim Spart Spartan king, as uh, Archidamus had died. Uh, all lands conquered during the last 10 years of warfare were to be restored. Prisoners were exchanged, meaning that the Spartans captured by Demosthenes were returned home. So in essence, what happened is that Athens had lost enough lands and suffered enough defeats at this point. They calculated that they could trade the hostages for the restoration of their colonies. Um, but this was another false peace. It didn't last anywhere near 50 years. 
and the proxies of Athens and Sparta continued to fight. It was only a matter of time until open warfare between the two city-states would rage once again. And it's kind of an odd tendency, if you think about it, that they keep trying to put off the conflict or settle it at the negotiating table, right? Thucydides seems to just record this conflict as just being inexorable, as we've said, and that it will inevitably continue between these two great powers until it is settled. And yet, even though individual actors make some bad or rash decisions and the democracy of Athens seems to often act unwisely, um, the pol- the what would you say, the political figures or the, the polities on the whole, right, are ultimately rational actors. And at many points, they sit down and try to set out terms to prevent further conflict as a rational actor would. But every time they fail because of the incentives driving them, which can't be thwarted by rational negotiation of terms, namely that neither can find themselves subordinated to the other. And since the interests of one conflict with the interests of the other, they continually create new conflicts between their various allies, and they can never avoid breaking the treaties that they continually try to make to stop this conflict. And so we're left with the feeling after seeing this happen time and again in the course of the conflict that it would have been the same outcome whether they'd never sat down and negotiated at all. Um, That the attempts to make rational arguments and appeals to justice and moral codes of conduct are all post hoc rationalizations, as as we've said, that for what suits the interest of the party making the argument, right? And that whatever moral position one holds, it's not determined by you know, adherence to universal moral standards, but by their relative position in the power relationship. And so that the, you know, Socratic or Platonic vision of men coming to an understanding of the right course of action through the intellect or through dialogue is not accurate. That when what is at stake is your freedom, right? Or your life or your death, your wealth or your poverty, dialogue is sort of a a farce that negotiation cannot ever overcome these brute realities of power. This is nowhere better demonstrated in the text than by the Melian Dialogue. It's one of the most famous or infamous sections. Um, But first, some background context on how we get there. So the hostilities resumed a mere six years later, after the 50-year peace of Nicias. It's really a six-year peace. A new Athenian general rose to prominence, Alcibiades. This is, if we remember from the symposium, the Athenian general and statesman who is romantically infatuated with Socrates in that particular text. Under his leadership, hostilities begin again when Athens brings a number of new city-states into the Delian League, including Argos. The Argives, who are the people of Argos, were a rival to the Spartans, and their city is located on the Peloponnesian Peninsula, which means that the Spartans just couldn't countenance Argos joining Athens, and thus having basically an Athenian ally like right on their doorstep. Alcibiades, meanwhile, joined with the troops of Argos and attempted to take the Peloponnesian city of Tegea. This culminated in the largest battle of the war, what Thucydides calls, quote, the greatest that had occurred for a very long while among the Hellenes and joined by the most considerable states, end quote. Again, the Spartan infantry simply could not be beaten, and the Athenians, as per usual, when fighting on land, couldn't overcome them. The cities of Argos and Tegea were reincorporated back into the Peloponnesian alliance. If Athens was to succeed in an offensive against the Spartans, they had to harness their powers over the sea. Their next target, therefore, was Milos. Milos was an island nation, but unlike most of the other islands, they refused to join the Delian League. Thucydides records the circumstances of the Athenian forces coming to Milos, and then the remarkable conference that was held between the Athenian envoys and the Melian leadership. Because this is such a important part of the work, I'm going to read most of it here, though in the interest of time we'll have to abridge in some places. Thucydides writes, quote, The Athenians also made an expedition against the Isle of Milos, with 30 ships of their own, 6 Kion and 2 lesbian vessels, 1,600 heavy infantry, 300 archers, and 20 mounted archers from Athens, and about 1,500 heavy infantry from the Allies and the Islanders. The Melians are a colony of Lacedaemon, 
that would not submit to the Athenians like the other islanders, and at first remained neutral and took no part in the struggle. But afterwards, upon the Athenians using violence and plundering their territory, assumed an attitude of open hostility. Cleomedes, son of Lycomedes and Tisius, son of Tisimachus, the generals encamping in their territory with the above armament, before doing any harm to their land, sent envoys to negotiate. These the Melians did not bring before the people, but bade them state the object of their mission to the magistrates and the few, upon which the Athenian envoys spoke as follows. Athenians, since the negotiations are not to go on before the people, in order that we may not be able to speak straight on without interruption, and deceive the ears of the multitude by seductive arguments, which would pass without refutation, for we know that this is the meaning of our being brought before the few, what if you who sit here were to pursue a method more cautious still? Make no set speech yourselves, but take us up at whatever you do not like, and settle that before going any farther and first tell us if this proposition of ours suits you. The Melian commissioners answered, To the fairness of quietly instructing each other as you propose, there is nothing to object, but your military preparations are far too advanced to agree with what you say, as we see you are come to be judges in your own cause, and that all we can reasonably expect from this negotiation is war, if we prove to have right on our side and refuse to submit, and in the contrary case, slavery. Athenians. For ourselves, we shall not trouble you with specious pretenses, either of how we have a right to our empire because we overthrew the Mede, or are now attacking you because of wrong that you have done us, and make a long speech which would not be believed. And in return, we hope that you, instead of thinking to influence us by saying that you did not join the Lacedaemonians, although they're colonists, or that you have done us no wrong, will aim at what is feasible holding in view the real sentiments of us both, since you know as well as we do that right, as the world goes, is only in question between equals in power, while the strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. Melians As we think, at any rate, it is expedient. We speak as we are obliged, since you enjoin us to let right alone and talk only of interest, that you should not destroy what is our common protection, the privilege of being allowed in danger to invoke what is fair and right, and even to profit by arguments not strictly valid if they can be got to pass current. And you are as much interested in this as any, as your fall would be a signal for the heaviest vengeance and an example for the world to meditate upon. Athenians The end of our empire, if end it should, does not frighten us. A rival empire like Lacedaemon even if Lacedaemon was our real antagonist, is not so terrible to the vanquished as subjects who by themselves attack and overpower their rulers. This, however, is a risk that we are content to take. We will now proceed to show you that we are come here in the interest of our empire, and that we shall say what we are going to say for the preservation of your country, as we would fain exercise that empire over you without trouble, and see you preserved for the good of us both." Melians. And how, pray, could it turn out as good for us to serve you to rule? Athenians. Because you would have the advantage of submitting before suffering the worst, and we should gain by not destroying you. Melians. So that you would not consent to our being neutral, friends instead of enemies, but allies of neither side. Athenians. No. For your hostility cannot so much hurt us as your friendship will be an argument to our subjects of our weakness and your enmity of our power. Melians. Is that your subject's idea of equity, to put those who have nothing to do with you in the same category with peoples that are most of them your own colonists and some conquered rebels? Athenians. As far as right goes, they think one has as much of it as the other and that if any maintain their independence, it is because they are strong, and that if we do not molest them, it is because we are afraid, so that besides extending our empire, we should gain in security by your subjugation. The fact that you are islanders and weaker than others, rendering it all the more important that you should not succeed in baffling the masters of the sea. Melians. <laughs> 
But do you consider that there is no security in the policy which we indicate? For here again, if you debar us from talking about justice and invite us to obey your interest, we also must explain ours and try to persuade you if the two happen to coincide. How can you avoid making enemies of all existing neutrals who shall look at case from it that one day or another you will attack them? And what is this but to make greater the enemies that you have already, and to force others to become so who would otherwise have never thought of it? Athenians Why, the fact is that continentals generally give us but little alarm. The liberty which they enjoy will long prevent their taking precautions against us. It is rather islanders like yourselves, outside our empire, and subjects smarting under the yoke, who would be most likely to take a rash step and lead themselves and us into obvious danger. Melians. Well then, if you risk so much to retain your empire, and your subjects to get rid of it, it were surely great baseness and cowardice in us, who are still free not to try everything that can be tried before submitting to your yoke. Athenians. Not if you are well advised, the contest not being an equal one, with honor as the prize and shame as the penalty, but a question of self-preservation, and of not resisting those who are far stronger than you are. Melians. But we know that the fortune of war is sometimes more impartial than the disproportion of numbers might lead one to suppose. To submit is to give ourselves over to despair, while action still preserves for us a hope that we may stand erect. Athenians. Hope, danger's comforter, may be indulged in by those who have abundant resources, if not without loss, at all events without ruin. But its nature is to be extravagant, and those who go so far as to put their all upon the venture see it in its true colors only when they are ruined. But so long as the discovery would enable them to guard against it, it is never found wanting. Let not this be the case with you, who are weak and hang on a single turn of the scale, nor be like the vulgar, who, abandoning such security as human means may still afford, when visible hopes fail them in extremity, turn to invisible, to prophets and oracles, and other such inventions that delude men with hopes to their destruction. End quote. Um... The dialogue continues with the Melians suggesting that the Athenians should desist because the Spartan allies may come help them or some other allies among the Peloponnese. But the Athenians are completely unmoved by this and rebuke them, saying, quote, The Athenians never once yet withdrew from a siege for fear of any. But we are struck by the fact that, after saying you would consult for the safety of your country, in all this discussion you have mentioned nothing which men might trust in and think to be saved by. Your strongest arguments depend upon hope in the future, and your actual resources are too scanty, as compared with those arrayed against you, for you to come out victorious. You will therefore show great blindness of judgment unless, after allowing us to retire, you can find some counsel more prudent than this." you will surely not be caught by that idea of disgrace, which, in dangers that are disgraceful, and at the same time too plain to be mistaken, proves so fatal to mankind, since in too many cases the very men that have their eyes perfectly open to what they are rushing into, let the thing called disgrace by mere influence of a seductive name lead them on to a point at which they will become so enslaved by the phrase as in fact to fall willfully into hopeless disaster." and incur disgrace more disgraceful as the companion of error than when it comes as the result of misfortune. This, if you are well advised, you will guard against, and you will not think it dishonorable to submit to the greatest city in Hellas when it makes you the moderate offer of becoming its tributary ally without ceasing to enjoy the country that belongs to you, nor when you have the choice given you between war and security. Will you be so blinded as to choose the worst? And it is certain that those who do not yield to their equals, who keep terms with their superiors, and are moderate toward their inferiors, on the whole succeed best. Think over the matter, therefore, after our withdrawal, and reflect once and again that it is for your country that you are consulting, that you have not more than one, and that upon this one deliberation depends its prosperity or ruin. The Athenians now withdrew from the conference, and the Melians left to themselves came to a decision corresponding with what they had maintained in the discussion, and answered, quote, 
Our resolution, Athenians, is the same as it was at first. We will not in a moment deprive of freedom a city that has been inhabited these seven hundred years, but we put our trust in the fortune by which gods have preserved it until now, and in the help of men, that is, of the Lacedaemonians, and so we will try to save ourselves. Meanwhile, we invite you to allow us to be friends to you and foes to neither party, and to retire from our country after making such a treaty as shall seem fit to us both." End quote. The Athenian response to this is to put the city to siege, and Thucydides records that the Melians are no match for the Athenians. The chapter ends as uh, as such. Uh, he says, quote, The siege was now pressed vigorously, and some treachery taking place inside, the Melians surrendered at discretion to the Athenians, who put to death all the grown men whom they took and sold the women and children for slaves and subsequently sent out 500 colonists and inhabited the place themselves, end quote. And so we may have been swayed by the democratic rhetoric of someone like Pericles and have come to see Athens as the good guys in the conflict because they're the Democrats, right? And yet here they're decidedly not the good guys in the sense of our modern morality, they express in their words a morality based purely on strength in which the strong do what they will and the weak suffer what they must, and the objections of the weaker party based on fairness and justice fall on deaf ears. This is a brute, terrifying reality that Thucydides records, where behind closed doors, without making all these appeals um, to codes of morality, the <laughs> Athenians make it quite plain that their motivations are power and that the demands of power and maintaining their empire require them to behave as they are behaving towards the Melians. And if anything, the Melians moralism looks a bit foolish in the face of this brutal, you know, uh, reality. And once again, we get the impression that the negotiations, uh, the dialogue, the exchange of ideas don't matter, right? That if they had had this discussion or not, it would have been the same outcome. So Nietzsche had a lot to say about this passage. Um, we can look at the aphorism entitled The Origin of Justice. This is aphorism 92 of Human, All Too Human, where Nietzsche writes, quote, Justice, fairness, originates between approximately equal powers, as Thucydides, in the horrifying conversation between the Athenian and Melian envoys, rightly understood. When there is no clearly recognizable supreme power, and a battle would lead to fruitless and mutual injury, one begins to think of reaching an understanding and negotiating the claims on both sides. The initial character of justice is barter. Each satisfies the other, and that each gets what he values more than the other. Each man gives the other what he wants to keep henceforth and receives in turn that which he wishes. Thus, justice is requital in exchange on the assumption of approximately equal positions of strength. For this reason, revenge belongs initially to the realm of justice. It is an exchange. Likewise, gratitude. Justice naturally goes back to the viewpoint of an insightful self-preservation, that is, to the egoism of the consideration why should I use, uselessly injure myself and perhaps not reach my goal anyway? So much about the origin of justice. Because men, in line with their intellectual habits, have forgotten the original purpose of so-called just, fair actions, and particularly because children have been taught for centuries to admire and imitate such, such actions, it has gradually come to appear that a just action is a selfless one. The high esteem of these actions rests upon this appearance, an esteem which, like all estimations, is also always in a state of growth, for men strive after, imitate, and reproduce with their own sacrifices that which is highly esteemed, and it grows because its worth is increased by the worth of the effort and exertion made by each individual. How slight the morality of the world would seem without forgetfulness! A poet could say that God had stationed forgetfulness as a guardian at the door to the temple of human dignity. End quote. And so Nietzsche extracts some great insight from studying Thucydides here that the two great powers of approximately equal strength are always attempting to negotiate and create terms among themselves, right? 
That's what Athens and Sparta are always doing. Even though they cannot hold to a piece, as each one might at any moment feel that their position is becoming stronger than the other, and attempt to press at those terms in order to determine what their opponent really can do, right? Um, can they really retaliate if we do this? Um, but in any case, because justice was established this way as a transaction among equals, it was essentially um, selfish, right? Or se- we'll say self-directed in line with the master morality of the ancient Greeks. It was among the weaker party, in this case the Melians, that we see the first hints of a justice derived from obligations and duties to others which are universal. And since they don't have the power to enforce these universal obligations and duties, the Athenians simply swat those away. But this is the kind of justice that we believe in now, a selfless justice, right? But that's simply because we have had that inculcated into us and feel that human dignity is served by this sort of universalist abstract concept of justice, a justice that transcends any one human motivation or concern. But this implies some sort of a judge that sits above both parties, doesn't it? And as the Melians say, in reality, the Athenians intend to act as their own judges in the dispute. And which superior party is there to tell them that they can't? And indeed, the Athenians did have the power in that situation as is demonstrated by the execution of the males and the population and the enslavement of the rest. It's, it's effectively a genocide, right? And so we're left with that same feeling at the end of the dialogue when the Melians, even after having been presented with a very honest statement by the Athenians of their intentions to use force against them if they don't submit, and a very honest explanation of how realist geopolitics works, meaning that the Melians will effectively be destroyed really for no purpose if they resist. Um, They simply haven't got a chance, right? The Melians still cannot do other than assert themselves against the threat because, as they say, they can't condemn their city that stood for 700 years to servitude. The Greek morality, which guides both parties, compels them to fight, and the articulation of their perspectives, that's what changes according to their circumstances, but the morality driving them again, as throughout this conflict, requires the, um, the clash of their powers to uh, continue, right? The negotiation in the end, uh, the dialogue cannot stop anything. Now, the Peloponnesian War ends in the years that follow owing to a couple things. First, there's a daring move by Athens, and one which completely backfires and is a catastrophe. <laughs> Second, there's a new alliance which made Sparta all but impossible to oppose. The daring maneuver we spoke of is the Sicilian expedition. Alcibiades comes up with this plan to sail to the Spartan colony of Syracuse on the island of Sicily, at that time controlled by the Greeks. There they intend to attack the Spartan colony in a surprise expedition with overwhelming naval force and deprive Sparta of a valuable colony. Nicias argued against this plan to the assembly, suggesting that the numbers required of ships, of troops, of experienced sailors would be too massive to undertake. But his description of the massive numbers of men and material that were needed actually had the opposite effect in the assembly, who perceived that this campaign would be even greater than anything attempted even by Pericles, right? And the glory of the expedition excited them. And yet, a religious scandal in Athens, possibly prompted by Alcibiades' political opponents, leads to Alcibiades being accused of sacrilege. Alcibiades, the great general, demands a trial immediately in order to clear his name before the expedition, but this is denied to him, and so he's forced to leave with his guilt or innocence to be determined after his return. Um... Ambitious men such as Alcibiades were often taken down in the course of such political machinations, especially after military victories made them all the more popular and powerful. And so, while Alcibiades was away, his opponents contrived to bring him back to answer the charges. And so, none of that was a very smart move on the part of the Athenians, and the result is that Alcibiades flees. And this brilliant general is exiled, And who does he go to but the Spartans? He not only tells them of the plans for the expedition to Syracuse, but then he goes on to lead the Spartans to several victories in the war. The Athenians condemned him to death in absentia and seized his property, but 
the loss of the great general who went on to lead the Spartans to victories was a, it was a huge loss for the Athenians. Without Alcibiades in command, and with the Spartans now aware of the Athenian plans, the expedition then fails. First, the Athenian navies destroyed, and a surprise attack was still in port, which is you know probably the worst case scenario for them. And then the Athenian troops trapped on the island are sort of hounded and waylaid as they attempt whatever defense they can muster, and in the end, tens of thousands of Athenians are killed and the captured soldiers are sold into slavery. Finally, the Spartans ally with, of all people, the Persians. They know that their only chance of overcoming the Athenian navy is with the power of a, you know, stature such as the Persians. And so in exchange, the Persians would be allowed to take the settlements and cities of the Delian League that lay in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, um, they can take those settlements into the Persian Empire. Sparta says that's fine. And so in, in spite of the popular image of the Spartans from films like 300, in which we, you know, we remember them for their just intractable defiance against Persia's entry into Greece, right? They're the most fearsome enemies of the Persian Empire. The Peloponnesian War ends basically with the Spartans asking for the Persians' help and allying with them. If our image of Sparta is the defiant 300 at Thermopylae, we're kind of like selecting one event and amplifying it to the exclusion of everything else because we like that story and we can fit it into our modern morality because it's like soldiers sacrificing selflessly for the benefit of all Greeks, right? But that view of them is a distortion. And I think this insight being given to us by Nietzsche's interpretation of Thucydides, you know, we we bring out that distortion of the the Spartans by having made all these virtues into selfless things, into duties, right? By forgetting the origin, um, and, you know, and imagining that the soldier selflessly sacrificing him in battle is something demanded by a transcendent morality instead of what Thucydides portrays in the text, which is human action as motivated by self-interest, by practical necessity, and by the considerations of the power relationship. After the Persian entry into the war, cities began to break away from the Delian League at an alarming rate, and shortly thereafter, Athens submits to Sparta. Their walls are taken down, the Athenian democracy is suppressed, and the reign of the 30 tyrants, an oligarchic government, is established. This is the context in which Socrates' dialogues occur and are recorded by Plato. In this period in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War and the defeat of Athens. Plato, as we have discussed, orients his project around justice. His conception of the ideal republic arises in the course of a discussion about justice, and he staunchly rejects the idea that justice is simply the right of the stronger to oppress the weaker, but that it's a standard that transcends all men, regardless of their strength, and that it requires us to act rightly. Plato's political philosophy in the wake of Thucydides' account of the Peloponnesian War, it appears to Nietzsche as something naive or ridiculous, right? I want to conclude with a look at a passage from Wanderer and His Shadow, the third and final book of Human All to Human. This is section 31. Quote, As men, for the sake of security, have made themselves equal in order to found communities, but as also this conception is imposed by a sort of constraint, as is entirely opposed to the instincts of the individual, so the more universal security is guaranteed, the more do new offshoots of the old instinct for predominance appear. Such offshoots appear in the setting up of class distinctions, and the demand for professional dignities and privileges, and generally speaking in vanity, manners, dress, speech, and so forth. So soon as the danger to the community is apparent, the majority, who were unable to assert their preponderance in a time of universal peace, once more bring about the condition of equality, and for the time being the absurd privileges and vanities disappear. If the community, however, collapses utterly and anarchy reigns supreme, there arises the state of nature, an absolutely ruthless inequality, as recounted by Thucydides in the case of Corsera. Neither a natural justice nor a natural injustice exist. End quote. 
So what Nietzsche does in this passage where he seems to mention Thucydides only in passing, but it's actually very illustrative of his point, he gives us an extra moral account of where equality and inequality come from. Neither is a quote-unquote natural state of affairs, but rather a response to the conditions of the polity. Equality or inequality are produced according to what offers security, which is another way of saying power, whatever offers power to the collective. And so the absurd privileges earned only by social rank vanish when there is an existential threat on the doorstep, and the entire collective coming to bring its force to bear against that threat is what matters. And when ruthless inequality appears, certainly no one could call this just, but neither is it unjust. Rather, this is the state of nature reasserting itself. Bella omnium contra omnes, the war of all against all. What Nietzsche concludes about justice, he learns from Thucydides in this respect. In the world that Thucydides shows us, quite contrary to Plato, justice is not a transcendent form, but something that emerges from power dynamics between individuals, and that what rules in nature has in fact nothing to do with justice and everything to do with power. And so that's all on Thucydides, everyone. That is the, a, the realist view of geopolitics, meaning a power-based view of geopolitics. And um, a, you know, first steps toward a scientific view of uh, you know, human life and events, which um, you could say is the beginnings of history. So I had a lot of fun with this one. Um, I think it's especially fun to cover Thucydides and Nietzsche's thoughts on Thucydides right after Plato. Um, I kind of went back and forth on whether I should really cover the whole Peloponnesian War, but it's such a fun story, so that's what we decided to do. And really, as I mentioned, you don't, we don't know a whole lot about Thucydides as a person. What we have of Thucydides is his book, right? his text, this history. And so the Peloponnesian War is Thucydides in some way, right? Um, this is the confession of who he is as a the example of the sophists, um, as Nietzsche sees him anyway. All right. Uh, so thank you for joining me, everyone. Uh, very excited for next week where we're still in the ancient world, but, um, we're taking a little bit of a 180 into from politics into anti-politics. Um, so join me next week where we talk about Epicurus. All right. Signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.